All right, since we have quorum, we will move ahead. We will go ahead and start the meeting at 3.37. You got the roll call already, Sarah? I think you know who's there. Okay. So we will move past roll call. Additions or deletions to the agenda. The following change to the regular order of business will be in place for today's meeting. Due to limited time availability for Hannah and the bylaws discussion and potential vote, I will move that report up to the four o'clock time slot. So why don't we go ahead and move to the consent agenda. We have six action items on the consent agenda. Is there any board member that would like to edit the current consent agenda? Okay, if not, I will move to approve the current consent agenda as listed. All those in favor? Second. Aye. Second. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Aye. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> okay, now all those in favor that we have Nick seconded. <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that would be unanimous. So we have a special guest. That would be Frida Gandhi to provide a quarterly update for the Spokane Youth and Senior Centers Association. So it's all yours, Frida. Hello. So Sarah, Hi there. I just click that button when I go through the slides. Okay. okay. Why, why Sarah work on that? I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Frida Gandhi. I'm the executive director of the Martin Luther King Center. I have been with the MLK Center for 23 years. Wow. wow. Um, how we came to be. Um, at East Central Community Center was um, the city issued a request for proposals in 2017 for a nonprofit to manage and operate East Central Community Center. So people thought that I was out of my mind when we <laughs> submitted a proposal. <laughs> Why would anyone want to do all that work? But um, I was excited to, um, I thought it was a great opportunity to house a lot of services under one roof that a lot of people in the community um, use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I was excited. I'm still excited um, to be there. Um, we have grown so much in the past um, five years. We've gone from 15 employees to 30. Wow. So wow. Um, yes, um, we kept a lot of the nonprofits that were in the community center before we moved in. It didn't make any sense to me to ask those organizations to leave when um, we were serving some of the same families. So we decided to build on and had additional square footage to house all of the services, our existing services as an organization and keep organizations like SNAP and WIC inside the building so that instead of parents having to um, get in a car or get on a bus and access those services, they can just now go right down the hallway because we're all under one roof and we have a food bank that's doing amazing, amazing work in distributing food to the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. it has become quite the operation. <laughs> <laughs> so I will get into um, our presentation and our slide. Oh, you're going to click the Okay, so as you can see, this quarter over 47,000 individuals were were served. So we're we're actually having a, a combined collective impact on our community. All of us are spread out, of course, throughout Spokane, and just serving um, individual parts or overlapping services for seniors in our our community. Our older adults need places to be and places that they can access other resources and stay connected and active in the community. And that's what a lot of the work at a lot of these places are being done. So here are your senior center, their fitness classes are doing amazing. They are still doing karaoke. I was really impressed with that 25 feet banana split. So I should have been there for that one. <laughs> um, they are still doing overnight trips, um, traveling to tulip fields. So yeah, next one. And then the senior 
Sento Senior Center is doing amazing. They've started their overnight trips again to Diamond K Ranch in Phillipsburg, Montana, also having barbecues and fiestas. And then the Corbin Center as well. Um, they've had some security upgrades. Um, they've also installed new doors, new windows. Um, infrastructure is important too. We also wanna make sure that our buildings are safe for everyone that um, participate or um, enter the doors of, of the city's community centers. So, yeah. And then you have Southside Community Center that's, you know, got bingo, raffles, different things going on as well. And then we have Mid-City Concerns. They've taken field trips to um, Second Harvest Kitchen, have attended Spokane Indians baseball games, and have taken field trips to Cattails. And then Project Joy, of course, is still spreading music throughout Spokane. They've been highlighting and showcasing some of their individual um, musicians. And then our youth programs, our youth organizations. Northeast Youth Center um, had, well, they did their annual trip to the cemetery on Memorial Day weekend, and the kids placed flags and pennies on the graves of veterans. Um, they've opened up their new classroom where they received funding from the Department of Commerce to do so and had a ribbon cutting with the mayor being there. And then West Central, of course, their youth programs are just doing an amazing, amazing job. They're participating in the Police Activities League, which is PALS. They have their day camp going on and also um, doing several hikes and other types of field trips for kids. And then Southwest, um, these are um, pictures of kids participating in karate classes. And then there's us. We had a huge Juneteenth. This is brought, that was our third annual celebration just in the parking lot of the community center. There were um, 50 organizations with tables. There was entertainment, music, petting zoo, which the kids love. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also we have our teen leadership program. We partnered with Delta Dental during um, spring break mm -hmm. and um, introduced them to different careers in dentistry. They got to do a lot of hands-on activities. So, yeah. And then that's the end. And thank you all so much for letting me present today. This is the first time I've done this. I've kind of dodged that bullet. It's not my turn, but... <laughs> But um, I was here at the last meeting, and I watched Claudia, and it, it's, it's great to be here. So I'm excited to be a part of this collaboration of community centers that are doing such great work in the community. So, yeah, it was all new to me. Um, we, had, we were in a 4,000-square-foot building on the corner of 8th and Sherman, and now that building can fit inside the one we're in now oh, and huh. then still have room. So, yeah. Awesome. No, Frida, great. thank you for all that you do and your entire team and the thousands of hours of volunteer work that I know are essential to, to what all you do. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Thank and you for you did great. Yeah. We're glad you you're did here. very good. Now you're an expert. You'll have to. <laughs> well done. Yeah. I didn't want to do too well. They might ask me again. <laughs> oh, yeah. <So. laughs> you're Thank welcome you. back anytime. Thank you, Freedom. See you. All right. Let's go ahead with the financial report. Rich? seen anything from Hannah? Okay. We'll just play it by ear. All right. Thanks for having me. Tough act to follow that. That was good. <laughs> Trying to keep this as exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start on the expenditure side. So on the two columns there in gray. You'll see we did have a little bit of an uptick there when looking at expenses to two-year budget averages. And we talked quite a bit in uh, Finance Committee on that. And there was some, um, a little bit of a discrepancy there 
from the inner funds. So as you know, we're charged four times a year for the primary, like workers' compensation, unemployment, risk management. And when they pull that came a month early this year. So kind of what we had forecasted was about 300,000 off. But year to date, that'll offset next month since last year they pulled that in August and pulled in July. So that discrepancy between those two gray bars is larger than last month, but is definitely something we're monitoring closely. Uh, revenues, those are trending really similar to what I presented last month, so ahead of the two-year budget average. And some of that is in general fund transfer, but really seeing increases in both recreation and riverfront. And then that kind of leads to the final two on the right there. So trending revenues ahead of year-to-date expenses. Right now we're a surplus about 735 735,000 for the year. If you recall last month, that was about 1.2 million. So in one month, we did eat through some of that surplus. Some of that is forecasted that we do plan on usually second half of the year eating into that surplus, but that was a little bit ahead of pace. So as department heads, we're all watching that closely. Like I said, some of that was in inner funds, but we are trending ahead of last year, year over year expenditures to budget. So that'll be watched closely, especially in the month of August as we have a lot of the temp season and a lot of those expenses that we can't control mm -hmm. before it gets winding down later in the year. That's Parks Fund. Any questions on that before golf? No. Okay. Well, golf was all good news again. Yeah. So they had another great month on expenditures. See, they're trending really closely with the two-year budget average, and that's even with the Pine Beetle capital work we had done early in the year. For revenues, Another strong month at 876 in total revenues. So they're 300,000 ahead of two or 2022 year-to-date revenues. And then bar column on the right there. So they're exceeding, exceeding revenues by over 800,000, excluding the facility improvement fee. And if you put that back in and the debt service payment, it's over a million dollars ahead of where they're trending last year. And that is same story for rounds played. So you can see 18 whole rounds are over, or almost 81,000 end of July. So exceeding last year and over the past five years, only one year that was higher than that being 2021. But then you can see on the bottom graph there, we have had some slight increases in greens fees since then. So when you look at it as cumulative revenue, we are trending higher than we have any of the prior five years. So all good things in golf. Indeed. Yeah. That is everything. Questions or comments on any of that? Rich, how's the, how's the progress on the 2024 budget? Is that right on schedule? It is. So they opened up the software week late, so I just got access to it this week. Mm -hmm. So okay. my plan for tomorrow is to get every change we wanted actually in the software, and then I will have kind of a finalized crosswalk, I guess, to see where we're at last year compared to this year, and then committees will have a little bit more of a finalized number. I think the... Only number that is not finalized, that's not totally within our control, is those inner funds that we talked about, yeah. that there may be some mid-month changes to those that could update numbers. But for the most part, it'll be finalized. And then the goal is to send some final recommendations next month through committees and park board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you bet. And thank well you. done. Thank you. Is she here yet? Checking to see if Hannah has put in an appearance. She sent us a text. She's running late with the meeting that she was trying to get out of. So we'll go with Nick. The prog progress update on the citywide neighborhood park investment executive committee. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So progress report to you today on the Citywide Neighborhood Park Investment Co Executive Committee. Um, pardon me if I'm looking at a screen which is away from everybody else, but I gotta see what I'm talking about, I think. <laughs> um, so really what we're working title here is healthy, healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Parks, or the other way around. This is an update on uh, what progress we made over the last few months. Um, so, you know, really, what is this all about? Why, why update this? Of course, everyone here is a, aware of the Park Master Plan update, the system-wide plan that was done from 2020 to 2022. Of course, adopting in middle of 2022. Planning documents are great. 
uh, if you use them for something. And so, you know, on the right here, you have the pavilion, which is a spectacular example of a really good project, I think, in Riverfront Park. And while we still want to do more work there, we look on the left here at Minnehaha Park, where we have the old wooden timber toys from the 80s that are still in place in a lot of our parks. And so we definitely heard, you know, through this master plan that the one of the key themes was really, you know, neighborhood parks. How do we get out into our neighborhoods? How do we invest in those locations? And, and that is a bit of an oversimplification of what's in that plan. There's a lot there. But that's one of the major trends that we see. I pull a couple of excerpts here from that plan to you for you, um, which both hint at the same thing, which is there's not a lot of operational funds available for the Parks Department to maintain what you have. And that over the last, you know, several decades, we've built a lot of things or rebuilt a lot of um, uh, facilities and amenities, and we really don't have the operational funds to care for them in the way we need to to keep them in good shape. So additional funding is needed to do that. And I think that's a trend that you all have seen for many years that the Parks Department has dealt with. So after the Park Board retreat and after the adoption of that plan in 2022, um, we sat down and thought, how do we translate a master plan into action? into some sort of an improvement. And so the, the plan, of course, was adopted back in June. Um, we worked through the winter and into the spring to say, okay, what are the real priorities for the community? How do we translate this? As staff, we kind of have an idea of what that could be, but we need someone that is, you know, not us, that is an outside entity representative of our, com of our community to help direct us. And that's that, that executive team you see there in May. Um, our, of course, you, had, you need a you are here arrow in any good presentation, so there's the you are here arrow. Um, our goal with this group was by September of this year to be back in front of the board with a presentation and a, uh, a resolution to, to take some sort of action. Um, and if that action needed some sort of a ballot resolution or a, an ask of the voter, we were really looking at somewhere between you know, November of this year to November of next year to be on that ballot. So there's some key background. I think you've seen it. I think there are others that haven't, but why neighborhood parks are important, um, why, why we see the need there. When we look at the bonds in the city of Spokane Parks Department, there have been three since 2000, so in the last 24 years, 23 years, excuse me. Um, all of those three, the lion's share of it, the big orange wedge, 75% of that has gone to what we call special use facilities. A lot of that's been Riverfront Park, and then in 2007, of course, citywide, we built pools. And those are heavily used and really desired by the community, so wise spending of money, no doubt. But the small wedge um, up here in the corner is your neighborhood parks, and that's been about a quarter of your spending. And so they've deteriorated over time because we haven't been able to put in the amount of resources that need to be really dedicated to those spaces to take care of them. I think that's why we're hearing from our community that, hey, you know, riverfront's great, pools are great. I need my slide to not be plywood and be a slide. Um, and so this graphic, I think, gets at that, which is the big blue dots, the lighter blue dots there, represent all of our facilities that have had zero capital dollars put into them in the last 20 years, which is roughly half of our facilities. And then when you look at the second smaller blue dot, kind of the lavender one, these guys, those are, those are facilities that have had less than a quarter of a million put into them over 20 years, which is really not much. Of course, we're mowing the lawn and taking care and cleaning the garbage, and Alice and his team are doing a wonderful job there. But we've really only had about 10, 15% of our facilities that have been adequately maintained and invested in over the years. So our master plan processed all that, crunched it down, um, came up with facilities that have major damage and need replacement. You know, so we use the green, yellow, red, orange scale there to say, you know, red is bad, orange is almost bad, yellow is not in good shape. These are facilities that need major work. You knew this. Um, all the while, people are looking at this. People are looking at what, what's being done at Riverfront and saying, gosh, we would love some of that in our neighborhood. So playgrounds, restrooms, trails and trailheads, particularly soft surface trails. Um, new parks in neighborhoods that are a huge amount of development, North Indian Trail, Laita Valley, that don't have parks. And so they don't have access to those facilities. And then just general maintenance. We'd like the garbage clean more frequently. We'd like the uh, lawn mown more frequently. We'd like it to look a little nicer. And we'd like you to address in some way whatever you can come up with security. Um, and then, of course, second tier desires, and this is, this is referencing the master plan here. The second tier are your, your amenities that folks want you to add. Pickleball, I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's one of them. All the while here, too, 
our trend in revenues has declined. And you know, we like to refer reference the, uh, the, the dwindling 8%, and that graphic in the top right really does paint that picture. So we like to think of spending on parks not as 8% of the general fund that nobody understands, but isn't every dollar the city spends out of $100, you spend two, two and a quarter on parks. And it used to be almost three. Mm -hmm. And so that's about $2.1 million less per year today than it was in 2000. And that doesn't even account for inflation. So really, we're, we're seeing increased reliance on our part on bonds to try and fix things. And so we're looking at how we deal with that moving forward. And in our master planning process, you know, three quarters of our folks thought we would support you to, to look at additional funding for parks, whatever that is. They didn't give us carte blanche to go asking for more money, but they gave us the sense that, yeah, we would entertain the cost of something. So enter the executive team. This is a group of you, consisting of Park Board and other community leaders that have been tasked with helping us develop an investment, specific investment in parks, that best satisfies the highest priorities of the master plan. There's a lot in that plan. We want to make sure we work from the top down in that list and get the most bang for our buck. So there are two deliverables from this group that we hope to be back in front of you soon with. And one of those is a specific program of improvements. Here's the formula. Here's the projects we see that we'd like you to do. Um, and we'd also like to have the second deliverable, which is the source, quantity, and term of the funding. Where is that money going to come from to pay for that work? So who's on the, the executive team specifically? Two of you. Actually, between two and four. Um, we've kind of been working around through the group, uh, park board members, two city council, uh, mayor's representative, two former, we call them subject matter experts, um, <laughs> two former city leaders in Rick Romero and Gavin Cooley, former CFO and, and public works director who have a ton of experience when it comes to bonds, levies, you know, voter, voter asks. Uh, the parks director, of course, uh, park operations director, and then support from other park staff as we need to do the work. We've had three meetings to date. We have one left. Uh, we worked through kickoff on timing and, and partnerships and funding and what are some of the options for how we do this work and what are your priorities in that group. We then worked to program balance. Uh, what is the right formula of project projects and, and in what locations? You know, where would those, uh, that work be, be occurring? When should we be doing this work and for how long a period of time? We then took that back and, and revised all of that a second time. Um, and now we have one more meeting scheduled in August to go over the financing packages associated with those options. So work that is rapidly you know, coming to um, a head. How does this committee provide direction? Well, this is a good example of that. We've done uh, really kind of a live polling format in this group where we're providing background information and via mentee software allowing our, our, our stakeholders and our advisors to poll directly for us so we get those real-time results to support conversations. Um, this is one of those where it's like, what kind of funding mechanism would you support? And gosh, Levy is at, at the top of that list after a lot of discussion. Um, so here's another example of, you know, if you were going to support a ballot measure, when should that occur? And you just sort of see these polling happening as we work. And, and right now there is a preference for that February time slot. Here's a good example of how that informs our work. Um, early on we asked, is the program balance of projects that we've come up with, does it work? Is it the right balance? And we kind of heard, yeah, it's kind of close, but it's not quite there yet. Next meeting, you're a heck of a lot closer. A lot more yeses. So this is, I think, an example of the power of that sort of a software to help us um, hone in, are we getting this right or are we not? We're not done, but we're on our way. So what is it? What is the, the program? Um, really, there are, are five, six major buckets here. One of them, uh, they're sort of operational piece and a capital piece to this. The capital piece is the bulk of the spending, but if you look at the top of the list, we say renovate and replace aging parks. The number one thing for us to do is to fix what we have and make it functional again. That's the blue wedge of that pie. That's about two-thirds, eh, between a half and two-thirds of what the overall spending might be. That would also include, include renovating some of these aging neighborhood parks to include new amenities. So again, pickleball reference. Um, think about how rec has changed from 30 years ago to today. So not only is it all of your broken playgrounds get fixed and your restrooms that aren't functioning get fixed, it's what are the new things like BMX, pump track, 
uh, where do we incorporate those parts and pieces? So a great example of this would be like the major renovation of Minnehaha Park or a major renovation of Grant Park or even a minor renovation of a neighborhood playground kind of citywide where it needs to happen. Um, new neighborhood parks. There are three locations in town in particular that have significant need. There are several thousand folks that are without a uh, 10 minute walk to a park, which is one of our standards. And so North Indian Trail being one, uh, Lataw Valley, Eagle Ridge being another, and then uh, the third being Shiloh Hills in Northeast Spokane. So the fringes of our development community were where parts, um, development was built without park considerations. Newer development, so to speak, at least since the 80s and 90s. So we do have a proposal here, the Orange Wedge, about 15% of overall spending to acquire and develop um, new parks. Two of the three properties we already own, with Shiloh Hills, which is Northeast Spokane, um, we would need to look to acquire land to build on. Um, so this is really to serve a need for folks that don't have access. Um, improving trailheads, trails, and natural lands. So you see this gray wedge here. One of the things we heard was we have you know, some nice natural properties that we own. We have, you know, think of the bluff, think of Palisades Park, and we have really poor access to a lot of these locations. So trailhead access, building proper parking facilities that have security lighting, that have access to kiosks, and then the actual trails themselves. How are they to be maintained and, and improved in those locations? So some improvements there. Um, the yellow wedge would be your enhance your m and staff and equipment. What we're really contemplating is somewhere close to a 50% increase in operational staff for the operation of our, our ability to empty garbage, clean graffiti, mow lawn, and do work. We are really looking for that improvement ability there. So working with Alan and his group to do that. And one thing that came up midway through our work is enhance park security. And that is really, can we have a visible presence or a, a rovering presence? Do you need me to? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Just want to make sure I'm not missing something. No, you're fine. Um, Thank you, Nick. Sorry. So, nope, you're good. Um, really, to have an ability to respond with rangers or something similar to our park ranger program in Riverfront Park to some of the outer parks, particularly in areas that are close to downtown that might be subject to some of the same sort of pressures and illicit activity we're seeing in other locations. While we don't have the specific answer for exactly what that is, whether it be by partnership with SPD or whether it be the Rangers themselves, we are working to acknowledge that that is something that needs to happen and that we need to have the ability to work with a security group of some kind to provide uh, a, you know, the level of, of, of safety for our folks that are in those parks. So think um, if, if it's clean, but I don't feel safe because I'm not sure what I'm looking at in the park, I might not go there, it's really to address that particular issue. So those are the key themes, and there's a lot of detail there that we're not yet sharing, but that we hope to be able to share in a lot more detail next month. As it, comes, as it applies to strategy, we, we, did, we have a, a pretty robust discussion on how do we implement this work. And over a period of time, we can get a whole pie chart of things done, but how do we start that? How do we take action immediately and maybe learn some of the lessons from Riverfront Park so we can get right out the gate on this uh, more quickly. And so that really is what we heard from our group was rather than ramp up operationally very fast, we'd like to see you implement some capital work quickly. So that first year really rolling out with some impactful um, capital projects, hiring you whatever your ranger or security staff would be that enti in its entirety in that first year would be one of the goals. And then increase your general operational staff over a several period, a year of uh, a two or three year period, excuse me. Now the overall implementation timeline of any sort of uh, program here has not yet been determined. That could be somewhere between 10 and 20 years is roughly what we're looking at, but that's a discussion yet to be had by the uh, executive committee. So there are several scenarios we're preparing for our last meeting here that vary from that 10 to 20 year time frame. And really the program, what we've learned, hasn't changed in those scenarios. We're looking at a set amount of work in a set amount of locations, but it's really um, how quickly do you want to do that? And some of the trade-offs to how fast you go or how expensive it is, mm -hmm. right? So if you were to go quickly, let's say in a 10-year scenario to accomplish all your work, you might move very, very quickly. You would generate more revenue per year for parks, but it would be a higher cost to your citizens. 
and it would be less reliable when it comes to hiring operational staff. If you think, you know, we might be reluctant to hire staff if, if they're only going to work for a couple years and we don't have funding mm -hmm. to hire, keep them on after that. Well, on the adverse, in a 20-year scenario, you might have a slower capital implementation, a little bit less annual revenue, but it'd be the lower cost to the citizen and, you know, more reliability for our, our hiring of staff. So those are some of the discussions that have yet to be had in detail, but that we're going to have here in August. So that's one of the final pieces we need to have um, evaluated here. And one of the things we're, we're having our financial consultants do is really evaluate any new debt or any new um, revenue in the context of existing bond debt. And so when do our existing bonds expire and how does that factor into this? One of the discussions we had was sort of rolling together you know, some existing debt with new and then what are the benefits and costs and alternatives to keeping everything separate. So that's, that's a part of that discussion as well. In any scenario, what we have heard from our committee and what we are pursuing pretty exclusively right now is the idea of levy in lieu of bond. And levy is important for a couple of reasons. Mostly because it allows us to uh, hire staff. Hire staff that can go maintain facilities. And that was something we really heard in our master plan was we want you to take better care of these places and you can't do that with a bond. You, and so levy really is the preferred mechanism of most park districts and it's very applicable in the case that we are looking at here. So transitioning a little bit to timing, we've had this discussion a couple of times, and the current philosophy is that February of 2024 would be the preferred time of the executive, executive committee to ask for any sort of ballot measure if there was a levy ask of the public. Um, I think that's still, uh, we want to be prepared for that and then see what ends up happening. So as a recap, the committee substantially agrees today on a general program for what parts and pieces should be in this levy. It's really important to say that there's no citizen on uh, the committee that isn't an elected official, a mayor's of, uh, office, or a park board a representative. And so no members of the general public here, but the program elements draw directly from the park master plan process, which was two years of public outreach. So we're really looking at that and saying, this is what citizens have told us. That is the basis and the foundation of what we're doing. And so that's where a lot of that involvement comes from. And not only is it in that plan, but it's a first tier part of that. It is a high priority out of that plan. The committee members also uh, tend to substantially agree that the funding type is preferred, preferably a levy, not a bond, for the operational staff reasoning that I mentioned before. Um, the, there is general preference for February of 2024 as the timing. And the implementation strategy being primarily capital initially while we ramp up that operational staff. So that's some of what we know today. Um, what we need to determine is how long a period of time any sort of uh, measure might last and how quickly we want to implement this work. And I think a lot of that is where you see the impact on the citizen in terms of the cost of the work. We have one more meeting here in August planned and we will discuss those items. We plan, and this is the important piece here too, we plan to be back in front of Park Board in September with a detailed list uh, program backup packet for you and a, a resolution. We would like to come before this group with a resolution after a recommendation from the group. That is assuming we get to a recommendation in February, or excuse me, in August. If we do, we'd like to be here with you asking you for your approval and adoption of that program and that funding measure, which would allow us to go to council and, and try and get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So our ballot resolution would be due no later than early December. We would target August, October to November uh, of this year to look at a ballot. So things would get pretty heavy pretty quickly here. So I want to make sure we had an opportunity to see this. Um, any questions or thoughts for us here today? Could we postpone questions just for a few moments? Hannah has came back online, and so we're able to maybe to run the bylaws reading and vote if she's still with us. Not a problem. Hannah, you're still with us. If you would like to, if you have, yes. if, do you have time to go over the bylaws <laughs> reading? And Nick, we will Sorry. we'll Was call you back loud? up. Not a problem. Go right ahead, Hannah. Take it away. Thank you guys for accommodating my schedule today. Um, we had our last bylaws reading at the uh, prior meeting. And after accepting some feedback to the bylaws that we proposed, 
the bylaws committee went back to the drawing board and restructured a few things. The bylaws um, are redlined and available in your uh, meeting packet, but the first change that you'll see is going to be in section nine regarding order of business. What you'll see there is in section eight, we reordered the subcommittee meetings based on our customary practices. So that isn't anything that I imagine will be an issue for anyone. It's just how we do things these days and we needed to update it based on our prior bylaws having the order incorrectly. The more substantive comment and change that we made is going to be in that same section nine. There's um, on page five of the red line, there's a public comment section that has been added. Initially, we had in added limitations to the content and duration of a public speaker's comment and um, also to when that public comment was going to be heard. What we've done here is we've taken our feedback from the prior meeting and incorporated it into this new language. Before I proceed on reading this, is there any problems with my audio or can you guys hear me okay? You're fine. We can hear you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm just going to read out this new section that's been inserted. It says all public comments must be submitted in writing to the park board via email or mail at the email address or physical address provided on the park board website. All public comments that are A, delivered on or before 12 p.m. the day of the meeting and B, related on items on the agenda for such meeting shall be heard by the park board during the public comment period of the meeting. Notwithstanding the foregoing, at any time prior to or during the meeting, the president may elect to hear public comments that are delivered untimely or are unrelated to items on the agenda. It is the intent of the park board that all public comments are acknowledged and addressed appropriately. In addition to that new section, we changed the amount of time that a public comment is permitted. Um, the city council permits two minutes for public comment, but we modified that based on what our regular practices are. And so we have a three minute public comment period. If there are any questions about that, we'd be happy to hear those now or take any uh, recommended, recommended revisions. Um, I understand that this is just an, a, a discussion item, but it could be moved to a, an item for a vote if there are no issues with the um, bylaws as they've been drafted and presented today. Nick? Uh, hi, hey, Hannah. Um, what do, do we have to have notwithstanding the foregoing? It just seems like extra words. In my mind, can it just start at, sure, so at any time? We we could, yeah, we could definitely delete that proviso. We don't need the legalese in there, but I I think it, I inserted it because it was just um, it, it was teeing off the next sentence, which said, "I know that we just said X, but Y is also applicable." But I understand your comment that it, it could be seen as superfluous, so I don't have any problem deleting that. Okay, and then I. I, did we talk about a time? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. I was just curious. I don't remember that conversation, but yeah. Okay. So cool. that's already in our in in the rules that we have. So on on the front of every agenda packet, it talks about public comment, and I borrowed that language directly from the agenda packet and inserted it here. Obviously, I need to read the agenda packet better then. <laughs> so okay, no, I'm good. Well, I don't think you give public comment often. Yeah, I don't. So. <laughs> okay, cool. No, I think, I th yeah, I think I'm good with the rest of it personally. So, any other comments, questions? Jennifer, Greta, Sally? I would like to see this move to an action item, Mr. President. Okay. If then no other questions or comments, Anna, do you want to submit it for a motion for the vote? Yeah, I submit 
for a vote the action item of voting on whether or not we will adopt these additions to the bylaws. And I'm not sure what other language I'm supposed to include in my motion uh, right now. Sorry. <laughs> I think I think that's adequate. Perfect. I second that. Jennifer seconds. So any comments or questions before Hannah puts it to the vote? Go ahead, Hannah, ask for the vote. All right, um, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 The vote passes unanimously. All right. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you for your work. Thank you to the bylaws committee. I know we've put a lot to you in the last few months, so appreciate your efforts. And Happy to do it, and thank you guys again for accommodating my time. Hannah, thank you for squeezing it in. It sounds like you had a very busy day, so we'll go back to Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Bye. So you, we left you with, or you left us with questions and comments, Nick. So yeah, you left me hanging, man. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, um, well, this gave people more time to think of questions. Yeah, December ballot. No, all good. It, anything that uh, you know, really, we're here to, to brief you on what work's been done, but then answer any questions you might have and, and incorporate any thoughts you might have too. Ideal timeline, Nick, that you that you have to get this presented and to the board and so on. If if it could run as smooth as as you wish, what would it be? If it went smooth as silk, we'd be here in September at the regular park board meeting asking with a resolution to, uh, to adopt a program and, and go to council. Now, we've talked about having like a special meeting to, even if it's just simply virtual, for Nick to go over any of the changes that will be, changes, additions that will be made at the, at the next executive committee meeting. Thoughts of members to do that um, because there's a lot that will be presented at the September meeting and if we had a, maybe a special meeting it would give us a chance to to discuss it more thoroughly at that time I don't know what other members think it's like a special park board meeting yeah. yeah I think we could fit it in either way I mean yeah. really it's a question so of what your preference is team has. yeah no, I don't think that's a bad idea I think if we could find a time, and again, if, if you can't be there, you can't be there, but for those interested, I think it would hopefully provide some additional information or more specific question and answer than trying to get it all done at the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and work with, we'll work with people's schedules and see what we can come up with for a meeting between now and the, and the next board meeting. Sure. And certainly it'll be after you're done with the work from the next meeting. Absolutely. All right. Any other, other questions other for thing? Nick? I have a comment. Comment? Yeah. If I could. <laughs> um, two things on the schedule I think it's important too. I think September is a crucial time for the park board because the city council process will take a while. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to go to committee first and then any type of resolution will have a first and a second reading on that as well uh, to meet some of those di uh, deadlines before we get in the holidays. Uh, another piece is we using the current makeup of the council that we have today. We are accelerating on a couple other items moving through uh, council because the, um, the certification of the election will be that last week in November where mm -hmm. the council will switch. It won't happen January 1. And so um, there is uh, interest from the current council to be able to take this on since they have been a part of this process. Um, my comment is, <clears throat> this came from Gavin Cooley, um, and this has a lot to do with the park board, the master plan, this process and staff. Um, saying in all his time and the process and thoughtfulness that we've put into this plan and these measures moving forward, he's the best that he has seen in his career and should be a model on how cities look at funding packages uh, for the citizens to be able to decide on and their priorities. So I just want to say a compliment to the staff and the board yes. that we've heard that wow. through the process as well. So, Thank you. Just one thought. As you're talking about safety and security, mm -hmm. um, don't always automatically go to people, mm -hmm. you know, labor resources, yeah. a lot of technology out there, um, mobile camera systems, different things that can be used in, in a, addition to physical security mm -hmm. to help us monitor or deter 
things at some of our parks and some of our parking lots. So. I totally agree with you. Um, we'll do a better job of clarifying that in September. I think we are thinking of it that way. Right. Um, what bucket we show it in is kind of where we're kind of flip-flopping because I think in a lot of our capital upgrades, one of the things we've thought about is what strategic security improvements can we make in restrooms and parking lots that direct our human resources? Mm -hmm. So um, what are those sorts of, whether it be locks or occupancy sensors or you know automatic locks and gates and such. So cool. I appreciate that and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll pay attention to that too. Awesome, thank you. Other comments, questions? No, I just like the presentation, having been in some of the meetings. So it really outlines very nicely. Sure. Thanks, Nick. We're leaving it intentionally yeah. vague today, but we'll yeah. be back with a, a pretty extensive packet, I think, for the next round on mm -hmm. this. Um, you'll have a lot more to see. We'll, tr we'll aim to get that to you well in advance of any special park board. Okay. Yeah, this is a great recap, recap of all the comments and thoughts and that we've given to you over the past three meetings. So thank you, Nick. Well done. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move ahead with committee reports. Urban Forestry. I know they met. Um, Kevin is excused absent today. I don't know if anyone would want to fill in for him that's on the, on the committee. That would be me, but uh, hold on. I'd have to find the minutes. I don't think I have a copy of the minutes. Okay. We met. There you go. <laughs> we talked about urban forestry. <laughs> and your next meeting will be September 5th at 415 in the Hives event room. Then we'll move to land committee with Greta. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, land committee met on uh, August 2nd at the um, at the library in Liberty Park and we had a few items we we actually approved revisions to sponsorship donations and naming recognition policy um, but we decided to have those go to the September uh, park board meeting when Kevin Brownlee is available because he was on the work group and um, can perhaps give a presentation for that. So look for that next month. Um, we had a discussion of a beautification proposal for Lower Lincoln Park. There's a shelter fire pit structure there that's just a concrete structure. And this is in the developed portion of the park, not the undeveloped portion of the park. And um, some, some groups from um, the Franklin Elementary School would like to work with the city and I, I think some artists beautify um, that structure. So we'll probably be hearing more about that. And then Al gave us some background on the budgeting. We also had uh, a discussion of our unfinished business items, which was a, an interesting discussion. And uh, you can refer to the land committee uh, meeting minutes for, the, for that discussion. And our next meeting is 3.30 p.m. on September uh, 5th, and it's uh, once again at the Liberty Park Library, and um, there's some nice projects going on outside the Liberty Park. There's a mm -hmm. playground and some irrigation projects that you can take a look at the same time you go to the meeting. Uh, but we're also holding it via WebEx. Huh. And that's my report. Thank you, Greta. Sally, you're up next with Rec. Great. Hey everyone, we had two action items. They were both on the consent agenda, but I did want to touch on the uh, contract, uh, amended contract that we did for the community, the centers. Yeah. I want to first thank everyone on the Rec committee that joined us to go through these applications. We did have six applications and we awarded four. And the four uh, recipients were the Urban um, Senior Center for $3,000, Urban 
for new computer system, East Youth Center for 2500 for new classroom furniture for the youth program, West Central uh, Center, Community Center for 2500 for classroom furniture and, excuse me, for classroom storage cubbies and Cinto Center 2000 for repair. This was at um, in time $10,000 capital investment. So really cool and happy to be able to help out the centers. It's also a reminder how uniquely different they each are and their needs are very different. So it's a good exercise to go through. We were sorry that we weren't able to fund everybody, however. So we had some discussion on here and just, a, just touching on a couple of things. Uh, I know there's more that's going to come through on the budget later, but on the rec budget, Jennifer Papich had mentioned, really not a lot has changed. We had a little bit more increase in income, but our cost increase are coming from temp seasonal staffing uh, that has increased significantly post pandemic. So it's something to keep in mind. We're still working on that. Um, excuse me. Um, the other, so a little bit more on the budget later, I think, but um, that's some of it. And I thought I wanted to bring up something else just a minute here. So there is a, um, there's a nice notable increase in revenue, 137,000 that we'll be reporting. This is all um, preliminary, but that was based on the cost recovery policy, which you're all aware of. There's some good work being done there. The other discussion item that I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is we started to do some talking and some work. I wanted to thank Jennifer and her team for pulling some numbers together. But the question came up about the resident, non-resident um, recreation program participation. There's been some conversation around does the, do we have enough um, non-city uh, participants that might be affecting our budgets as we're looking at cost recovery and other um, smarter ways to look at our budgeting. So there's some preliminary numbers and it looks like on average about 25% across the board, rough number, are non-residents for our programs. Well, we're also looking at, however, our city residents being bumped out of some of these programs. The most popular ones, especially SWIM and um, Corbin, some others. So we're doing some work there and uh, more to come. Uh, there's been some suggestions on maybe we can offer our city residents um, priority registration. We know that, and Jennifer's doing this homework in other locations, what they're doing. Do they, um, do they add an extra fee for non-residents? All of this is just being scanned and reviewed and discussed. Uh, and uh, I think it's really smart to be doing that at this time and seeing um, how we want to move forward in the future with making changes. Uh, if you haven't seen the activity guide, it's beautiful. And now it's a triannual. So it crosses, like the one that you have hopefully at home is summer, fall. And so that's going to be um, just looking at possibly a new model in how to um, uh, use the activity guide. Podium is continuing the uh, use. And I want to, you know, hats off to the team and everybody involved in that. I, we had, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look at a number here. Well, this is in your notes, but uh, there's going to be some upcoming meetings with this, but bad mat badminton is currently underway, and that coincides with the USA Badminton Junior National Championships. So they're starting to do more coordinating um, what's already going on at the podium so that we can use it and it's not so expensive to change the flooring. 
A couple other highlights I just wanted to bring up is the increase in participants. Quarter two review, we 715 participants more than we had in 2022. And we had 2,316 more sessions offered. And again, hats off to the whole rec team for just an amazing job. The total number of active um, sessions increased by 181. And aquatics, uh, temporary seasonal welcomes, um, we had over 89,000 visitors as of July 31st. So really nice to see all that use in our pools. That's pretty much um, what I wanted to share with you and just Again, thank Jennifer and her team for an amazing job. Our next meeting will be, uh, when is it? September 6th at 5.15. Thank you, Sally. A, a great recap showing that REC, as we know, is very, very busy, especially during the summertime. Thank you. Um, golf? No, let's say Riverfront, I'm sorry, is next, Jerry? All right. <laughs> I was never sure where you wanted to have me. Who in knows where I'm going? Particular time. Anyway, Riverfront Park uh, Committee did not meet. Uh, we did run our action item though through uh, finance, and uh, it was just a repeat. You can see it in your uh, packet. Uh, we are still going to be having our Zamboni for the winter. Uh, <laughs> we're just going about the financing in a little different manner. And uh, we didn't have a lot going on. However, when I walked in today, it was quite refreshing because I talked to John. And uh, we do have a visitor. And we have someone that has been hired uh, to be at Riverfront Park as a go-to guy taking the place of Kevin, Sherry, who has been here before for a very long period of time. And John, would you come up and just introduce him for us, please? Tell us a little bit about him. You didn't know you'd be front and center, but huh. I, just, I think I, this you know, is great. I, I'm, always, I'm always prepared. I so know. <laughs> I even brought notes. No, uh, <laughs> so with me today, I'm happy to introduce Mike Prince uh, to the park board. Uh, Mike comes uh, with 34 years in the United States Navy and has just been, he's been with us for about eight weeks now and has been just doing a phenomenal job getting up and going and his leadership has really started making an impact uh, with our maintenance team and with that I'll uh, let him introduce himself more. Oh, Thank you for inviting Thanks, me. I didn't, I didn't actually I plan on I know you weren't ready but that's okay. <laughs> Thank I just you for could not invite me. Uh, I didn't really actually plan on uh, speaking. Uh, I, actually, it's really been uh, really exciting to be here at the Riverfront Park. Uh, my family grew up here uh, oh, and uh, had the opportunity to uh, visit regularly. Uh, and then now, actually, it's, a, it's an honor to be working in the city uh, at the park, uh, you know, that my family once, uh, you know, and still actually loved to come to. So. But uh, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I don't want to take up any more of your time. No, you're great. No, Welcome, Mike. We were just Welcome. really excited to see you and uh, kind of been waiting to see who John might find and someone that, you know, really has a love for being in the parks, and especially down at Riverfront. So we welcome you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Park Board. So with that... Riverfront Park Committee will meet on September 11th, and we meet in the pavilion, and uh, we will be meeting at 4 p.m. Thank you, Jerry. Golf Committee, Nick. All right, I am gonna back up for a second, though, because you caught me off guard with the uh, uh -oh. <laughs> urban forestry. So the only thing I wanted to point out in urban forestry is please take a chance to go look at the minutes and look at the fuels reduction presentation. Uh, Nick Jeffries from the Spokane Fire Department gave a really good presentation on fuels reduction and defensible space as it comes to forest fires and fires around our area. Um, as we experienced some in, in our um, Finch Arboretum the other day and up in my neighborhood, uh, it's definitely something that people need to be thinking about. We have a lot of great trees and we talk a lot about our, 
our canopy and stuff like that, but that not, is not always a good thing in a fire situation. And so uh, just take the time to go look at that presentation. It was very well done. All right, golf. Uh, Mark Gardner introduced us to Ben Fritz. He is the Freddie Foundation intern who's working out at Qualchen. Uh The Freddie Foundation is a, is a foundation that was set up by the family of Sean Freddie Fredrickson. Um, he was killed um, in 2020, and he was a pro that was well known throughout the communities. And um, this, this foundation provides uh, internship opportunities and also, from what I understand, scholarship opportunities. Uh, he's been out replacing sprinklers and doing work out at Qualchin and, and doing a really good job. So it was really nice to, to meet him and, and look forward to, to getting to know more about him in the future. Uh, Jennifer gave a presentation about the Rosars Open. Um, we had 168 PGA professionals play in the Open this year. The course was obviously, it's in amazing shape, all our courses are, but um, we, really, we really show it off during the, the Rosars Open and, and ultimately raised $170,000 for the Vanessa Behan Crisis Nursery. So that's mm -hmm. amazing, that's amazing, mm -hmm. really love that. Uh, we went over some budget and capital projects conversations and we still have some more conversations to come about greens fees, uh, capital uh, mm -hmm. project plans, uh, prioritization of those capital project lists and that kind of stuff and so there'll be some more to come as we get closer to voting for our budget for the next year but um, it was good conversations a lot of good ideas were thrown out there um, we have a lot of needs especially with equipment and stuff so more that we need to address in the future um, of course again the courses are in amazing shape our finances are doing awesome and our next meeting is going to be in September sometime September 12th at 8 a.m. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. The Finance Committee met Tuesday, August 8th at 3 p.m. in the Shadle Park Library meeting room and via WebEx. There were two action items that were approved and were part of the consent agenda. Rich Lentz presented the July financials. July salary-related expenses were significantly less than July of 2022 because of three pay periods. We just kind of alternated them in, in June. It went the other way, so th so this balanced out for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Park's finance team is working on the 2023 budget. The next finance meeting will be Tuesday, September 12th at 3 p.m. in the Shadle Library events room again. So that's it for finance and DVC with Jennifer. Thank you, Bob. The Development and Volunteer Committee meeting met at 4 on Wednesday, July 19th in the Liberty Park event room, and that immediately followed on the heels of the Citizen Advisory Committee for the DVC. It has become increasingly obvious as we've had these meetings on separate weeks that we were often repeating information, and so at this meeting it was discussed that in fact going forward we will have combined meetings. We will start with the DVC sharing, the DVC CAC sharing among the friends groups for information, um, so that they can share how their fundraisers and events have been going, ask for questions or to be resolved or, or receive feedback um, and maybe help or suggestions from other friends up groups, and then segue right into the DVC. A lot of what we discussed at the DVC is the upcoming expo celebration. Um, we do have one member change. Uh, Christina Verfuel, as you all know, is found a job in Seattle, and so through the park board interview process, one of those interviewees indicated a real interest in being on the DVC, and that does act as sort of a holding tank for future park board members because when we don't have an opening, there's still a way for people to get their teeth uh, cut, so to speak, on park board matters and uh, hit the ground running, so to speak, when there finally is an opening on the board. So um, that was primarily the, um, the gist of the meeting. We did discuss a fundraising template being created and possibly added to the toolkit. Um, in general terms, of course, without specifics, without specific donor information, but potential resources for where to go to find those partnerships with businesses and perhaps individuals who would be looking to make an impact on the city being new or having a new initiative or mission objective and finding that Parks is, in fact, a very good partner. Um, and Kelly Brown gave an expo update. I understand, Bob, Kelly gave you her notes because she was not able to be here today for the CAC. You understand correctly. 
Um, Kelly said it was brief, basically that she, she mentioned again that they combined the, the two meetings, the CAC and the DVC, and they're, they're still trying to fill vacancies at both the committees. And she said that was the extent of her update. Okay, very good. In case you don't know, uh, going forward again, the next meeting of the combined Citizen Advisory Committee and the full Development and Volunteer Committee will be August 16th in the Liberty Park Events Room at 4.30. And we found that when we did that at this last time, the whole thing lasted 45 minutes. It's a much more efficient use of everyone's time. And just so you know, the Citizen Advisory Committee is made up of the Friends of Manitou, Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park, Friends of Palisade, Friends of the Bluff, Friends of Riverfront Park, Cincy Shaw from the Logan Neighborhood Council, and potentially, if they can attend, the Friends of the Spokane Skate Parks. And then in addition, we have three park board members, four potentially, Kelly Brown as the president of the DVCAC and Julie Bickerstaff as a community assembly representative, potentially one more community at large person. So thank you again for the opportunity to talk about that, and we hope that by combining these meetings, it will be much more efficient for everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. The bylaws committee, as we know, they met, and we had the, the reading and the approval of the bylaws changes. So that ends committee reports. We'll go to the president's report. Uh, John Moog provided an excellent recap of July activities for Riverfront Park. He sent that in an email to to the two park board members. So if you get a chance, take the time to review that email if you haven't already. Some really great numbers again from Riverfront. As you know, Nick Hammond presented the recap of the Neighborhood Parks Investment Executive Team progress. And the final meeting for that is August 23rd with the intent of preparing a final draft, as he said, to to be presented at the September meeting. The mayor's office has the two applications for our vacant board position. Jennifer and her team sent that to the mayor's office on July 15th. One of the candidates has completed their interview and the other is scheduled this week. Her, her choice will then be forwarded to the council for approval. And it, it seems like the council's schedule is a little bit intermittent at the moment, but we're hoping to have that member here for the September or our October meeting. I appreciate the member recommendations for timing of the board retreat. It looks like we will plan to schedule that sometime in October. And if all goes as planned, we should have our new member approved by then. I have received a few suggestions for discussion items. If you have any others, please send those to me. And that's my report. Um, We'll go to the liaisons, cons Conservation Futures, Nick. No, nothing. Parks Foundation, Barb isn't here. I, I did not get an update from her. I don't know if anyone did. Okay. If not, we will move. Well, our city council's not here, so we've gone quickly through the liaison reports. And Garrett, take it over. All right, perfect. Well, I'm just going to um, hand it off here just real quickly. I want to thank uh, the board members and staff and Jason as I've taken on a couple extra duties. Uh, within the city short term, so he'll give the a report. And then also, if you didn't hear, Councilman Bingle had recently had twins. Yes. Huh. So that's why he that's is great. not with us today. So congratulations to, to him and his family for two additional little ones. So for that, thank you, Jason. Great segue, Garrett. Thank you. Uh, two additional park users coming our way here in the next, uh, next coming months. Um, busy, busy month of August. It's kind of the finished strong month of summer for us here in Parks and Rec. Uh, you will see under park planning some ribbon cutting invites coming your way soon. We have great things uh, happening over the next couple months. For example, Susie Stevens Trail and the Liberty Playground we think will open in September. Grant Playground is also scheduled to open in September. Wild Horse Park will open in September or October depending on how fast construction goes. I uh, want to say thank you to our friends in Spokane Fire, the police department, our own park rangers, Department of Natural Resources, and the Bureau of Land Management and other first responders with their very quick support and skilled response to the recent fire that Nick mentioned at Finch Arboretum here recently. Could have been a lot worse, uh, not only for our Arboretum, our golf course, but just the entire neighborhood um, in Spokane. 
uh, recreation and golf continues to do busy things. Um, Jennifer Pappas just passed me a number. Uh, Aquatics wraps up the end of the August. We've already broken the 100,000, 107,000 uh, attendance mark with a couple weeks left to go. Don't let that scare you off. If you're watching at home, we still have room for you, but we'd, we'd love you to come out and swim before the season ends, which gets here way too soon. Our summer camps have been f consistently full or, or nearly full, uh, each one of them. Our city golf championship is at the end of the month, uh, the 25th through the 27th. This year's courses include Downriver, Indian Canyon, and Qualchin in the rotation. Riverfront Park continues to be busy this month with, uh, I think there's three more paid concerts and all kinds of free concerts if you attend Pig Out in the Park and some of the other events that are Spokane uh, legacies. Uh, good way to start stretching your stomach out for, uh, for upcoming holiday season. And park operations for those that, it's a great time of year to go visit our parks. Uh, Manitou Park, I was just up there last week and wow, they've got Duncan Gardens just dialed in and just dialed in. So thank you very much for the, your time. Thank you, Jason, well done. So we move to public comments. We didn't see any forms filled out for that. Um, correspondence, there wasn't any that was passed on to us. So any comments, questions before we adjourn the meeting before five o'clock, which, which will be great. Wow. I know. All right, we will go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 448. Thank you all for being here and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Bob.